Good morning and welcome to church this morning. It's such a privilege to be able to gather together. Welcome to you if it's your first time with us at Harvey Bay Baptist Church. This morning we are going to get going and just worship our God. Russ, thank you so much for joining us today. It's so good to be able to talk to you uh, and to just hear a little bit about you as one of our elders here at Hubby Bay Baptist Church. Uh, so, Russ, uh, please, if you'd just like to tell me what you do uh, for a real job. <laughs> <laughs> for a real job. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I work um, at FCAC. I'm, I'm a teacher. Um, I teach year six at the moment. Um, yeah. I have... You know, had many different roles there, like for the last 20 years. Yep. Um, but right now, I'm just teaching my one class of year sixes, and that's just awesome. Like, yeah. They really are um, 
at a stage where um, you know you can influence their lives. Yeah, yeah and we just have great discussions. So yeah, that's, cool. That's I think awesome. you'd you'd be a pretty cool teacher. You'd have some good. Uh, good discussions. I remember you sitting here reading stories to the kids and it was great. Oh, yeah, yeah. I wanted to sit in front <laughs> of them. Uh, cool. So you're a teacher. You've been doing it for over 20 years, right? Yep. Um, and uh, now you're a man of many hobbies. Uh, so just what is the hobbies that you love? Uh, yeah. what, what gets you out of bed when it comes to yeah, hobbies? Well, one of my main hobbies is um, I play the drums. Yeah, uh, sure yeah. you do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I've heard um, about the drums. <laughs> but that's actually not um, panning out so well. And like, what, just don't speak to Colleen about them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, there's actually a, a set of drums on sale. Yeah, yeah right? I heard that. Do you, do you want it prices below? No. <laughs> yeah. But uh, seriously, though, um, uh, I do kiteboarding and kite foiling and things. So anything to do with water, waves, yeah. the wind. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You'll just, yeah. I'm always watching the wind. B bit of an adventurous guy, hey? <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Um, Russ, a as an elder, um, it's really calling, right? You're a, you're a leader of this church, and um, th there's a reason why you said, yes, you, you know, God's calling me to this. Uh, what is your heart for Hubby Bay Baptist Church, uh, for who we can become? Yeah, so um, I, you know, I'm, really involved, well, my, my biggest passion really is, is my teaching yeah. and things, okay, so, and that specifically relates to children, yeah. and so I really want to see, um, you know, the children being, uh, you know, looked after within the church mm. and, and put at the forefront of things, and, yeah, and you know, they're not in, the, not in the background, and, and not just accommodated sort of mm. thing, but um, pretty much, um, yeah, front and center. Um, yeah. They are the future for our, for our church. And, Absolutely. Um, you know, my teaching also goes into, you know, like I believe it's my calling. Mm. And, um, yeah, it's, it's about having those God conversations with those kids. Yeah, yeah. that so, is great. You know, like every moment that you get um, at Kids Club or Kids Church, and um, yeah, it can be a really special moment that can change their lives for forever. That's great. Yeah. And you're really in so. infiltrating, right? Because you've got uh, Colleen now looking after children's ministry and absolutely. doing a great job. So uh, you've got a good voice yeah. there. And I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to going back to Kids Club. When yeah. Kids Club opens up again and then also just coming back because I've been mm. off for a couple of years. Um, yeah, that's going to be awesome. That's awesome. Really good. And, and that's really encouraging. I think a lot of parents would feel encouraged that, that one of the elders uh, sitting, is sitting there always with the kids front and centre, how can we serve the kids, how can we um, teach them about Jesus, right? Yeah. Um, and I agree with you, they're, they're, they, are, they are the future of this church. So, um, Russ, none of us would be here without that moment where uh, Jesus became real in our life. Uh, so, uh, if you'd just like to share quickly what um, that moment was like for you and just yeah. a little bit of your testimony. Yeah, so I was brought up in a non-Christian home, mm. um, and was actually, um, you know, at uni actually. Yep. And I, I was just like um, always a searcher, yep. always searching for the truth, and yes. and I sort of believed that should the, you know, should there be truth, okay, mm. there's going to be one truth, okay, mm -hmm. like one way. And so I was always searching for that. Um, you know, during uh, uni, my first year of uni, I went through like quite a traumatic experience. I was involved in a an accident, like mm -hmm. a motorcar accident. Yep and where someone died, sort of thing. So that actually pulled me down to rock bottom. Like, got pretty depressed about it, and um, lost my friends, and my friends were nowhere, nowhere to be found. Um, but through that experience, okay, and with um, knowing various Christians, okay, um, my best friend from uh, high school, actually, was a very strong Christian, and they were always praying for me, and looking out for me, and just, yeah, showing compassion towards me. Sort of thing. So they were instrumental in, in you know, getting me through to church, mm -hmm. um, and I saw the light, <laughs> and, and awesome. everything changed. You know, like some people talk about Christianity being a crutch, but uh, I look at it as more like a, a stretcher, <laughs> okay? Because I needed to be carried, mm. okay? So and Amen. God carried me and mm. lifted me up from there. Uh, um, I love what you say there because uh, I spoke about it last week, right? are those moments in our life that we just don't see how anything good can come, could come from them, right? Yeah. And, and it's that moment when we can look back now and say, wow, yeah. like through that horror and, and tragedy. Yeah, so, you know, everything mm. changed. And then also, you know, just us as a family, uh, you know, we've been through our tough times yeah. as well. 
um, you know, through the years. And through all of that time, uh, God has just always been there for mm. us. Has always just been carrying myself and my family yeah. um, through all of that. Um, so, mm. like, I particularly like just um, in Psalm 92, okay, um, it just talks about God being my refuge, mm. yeah, and my fortress. Mm. And, yeah, I will trust in Him, and mm. that's it, okay, that's what it's all about. That's okay, awesome. It's about going straight back to God. Mm. And, like, we've all been through some crazy tough times. Yeah. And, yeah, just come back to God. That's it. He's waiting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, just for anyone who is uh, watching this and wants to know, okay, what, what happened in your life that was traumatic, right? <laughs> I think it was week one or week two. If you go to the interview segment of our uh, first week or second week, and I'll, I'll put the link below of that video, uh, you'll actually be able to see uh, Colleen telling us uh, a bit about her testimony and how God provided through that time. I think it's a great... Uh, time for that and yeah. it's a great opportunity to just share how God uh, through hard times comes through and really uh, strengthens us absolutely uh, Russ Amen. it is an absolute privilege to have you as an elder and to serve under you so thank you so much for your obedience and for sticking up for the kids uh, thank you it's a privilege for us to serve you as elders <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much Thanks again, Leighton, for another interview and to hear uh, God's work in Russ's life as, and uh, Russ being one of the elders within our church. It's great to um, get to know him a little bit better. Uh, we're going to pray for the elders in a minute, but um, also as a community, we pray for others within our community, uh, organisations and churches. And uh, we might be a bit biased. We love Harvey Bay, but we know that we're only going to grow as a community as we work together. So this morning, we're going to pray for the Salvation Army, for um, Aaron Reed, Captain Aaron Reed. And we know that they had Red Shield Appeal not that long ago, and funds weren't as high as they would have normally had. So we're going to pray for a real blessing of finances for the Salvation Army and the work that they do within Harvey Bay and everywhere else. But also, uh, I have been speaking just a few days ago to Julie Terry, who runs the RI program within our schools. And we have RI teachers ready to go, and she just uh, was praising God that Term 3, they are able to start back in the schools teaching RI. So we're going to pray for them this morning as well. Now, as um, disciples of God, we also give with our offerings. You may not be aware of the work that um, is done with finances within our church, but we are obedient to God in giving our finances to see people blessed, and we want to see people come to know God. So we're going to pray for our finances, and you can give online or take your um, offering into the Bank of Queensland here in Harvey Bay as well. So we're going to pray for those things now. Won't you join me? Oh, Father, what a blessing uh, to have you in our lives, so faithful, and um, we know that we can trust you in all things. Uh, we thank you for your presence with us this morning as well. Uh, Lord, we want to commit a number of things to you this morning and we think of our elders as leading the church through this time and we know that it's been challenging for many who have been in leadership to know the directions to head. So, Father, we want to commit our elders to you who are seeking you uh, regularly to know your will for us and to just see us through the changes that are necessary and just working with regulations, etc. at this time. Would you just bless and refresh each one of them? Lord, within our community, we want to commit to you the Salvation Army. We want to pray for Aaron and the work that he is doing within um, the Salvation Army here in Harvey Bay. But Lord, we want to pray too that you will provide for them. We know that their finances are used to just bless so many people and to meet the physical, emotional needs of those that are within our community. So Father, would you just bless them um, with the finances that they need to continue the work that they are doing in this place? Father, for the RI um, teachers within the school, religious instruction, and I want to just raise Julie Terry before you, pray that you will guide her as she speaks with principals in schools, Father, as um, 
she goes in and just seeks the openings there. We thank you for this important work. We want to pray for all of those teachers, um, your protection over them, just your um, refreshing on them as they head back into the schools for Term 3 to teach students about you. And Lord, we want to pray for our offerings this morning that we have given online or are going to give during this week. Lord, would you use those finances for your work um, here in Harvey, Harvey Bay and beyond. And Father, as we just continue to worship you this morning and hear from your word, uh, we pray that you will teach us and grow us in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Before the beginning of time With no point of reference You spoke to the dark And fleshed out the wonder of life And as you speak A hundred billion galaxies are born in the vapor of your breath the planets born if the stars were made to worship so will I I can see your heart in everything you've made every burning star a signal fire of grace If creation sings your praises So will I So will I God of your promise You don't speak in Vain, no syllable empty your voice. Once you have spoken, all nature and science follow the sound of your voice. And as you billion creatures 
of salvation. It chased down my heart through all of my failure and pride. On a hill you created, the light of the world, abandoned in darkness to die. Good morning again. The series that we're looking at at present is How Can I Be Happy When Life Is Tough? And the particular topic today we want to be able to share is Where Does Real Confidence Come From? The Oxford definition of confidence says it this way The feeling or belief that one can have faith in or rely on someone or something. If confidence is therefore directed to a person or an object, we ask the question today, where does real confidence come from? Where can we place this faith or trust and know it will respond with the expectation that we are seeking and not bring further disappointment back into our life? We often refer to certain people as confident people because it seems as though they have an expectation to consistently look forward to the future for good outcomes. Uh, This could happen because they are talented in some way. It may just be their disposition in their personality. It could be from some other um, aspect that has allowed them to be able to look forward with a capacity to be positive. But this morning we want to look at Psalm 27, which is one of King David's account of where his confidence came from in his life. If we start to read from verse 1, he said these words, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advanced against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. 
Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. And in his sacred tent or his tabernacle, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. These verses are an unashamed declaration by David of his own testimony and conviction. It is a statement of his foundational value system, with what lies with him in as the anchor to his soul. He says at the beginning, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Light is an important word picture with the positive connotation regarding the redeeming work of Jesus in bringing into relationship with himself and removing from them the darkness of condemnation. Psalm 18 and verse 28 tells us, You, O Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. As a floodlight immediately repels the darkness once the switch is thrown, so God has the capacity to repel the darkness in our lives. Micah chapter 7 and verse 8. Do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Right now, in many and various and even extreme ways, the world we live in has a tension between these two. It may even be that we personally find ourselves living in darkness or shadows rather than the beauty of pure light. It's recorded that in the end times, in Revelation 22 and verse 5, there will be no more night. They will not need to light the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. Light is a commodity that we cannot do without. And it enables us to be able to see our life and the world in its truest perspective. It's combined here by David with the word salvation. He is my salvation. This is a powerful combination of two words. Light is a revelation of our circumstance. But if the light came and only revealed the circumstance that we were in, but gave no other way forward, we would now be simply aware of our predicament in a highlighted way, but would still have no power to extradite ourselves from those circumstances. It would be like someone walking on a dark night and falling into a pit and unable to get out. A stranger could come along with a torch and, and show it into the pit. And the man or whoever was in there would see that where they were stuck. But just imagine the person with the torch just said, oh, you're stuck in a, in a hole, and then walked away. That would not change that person's predicament at all. But God being our salvation means that he has put in place a plan to lift us out or cause us to rise above the circumstances and the predicaments of our life and give us a totally new beginning. This was his plan for us through Jesus Christ at Calvary. The Lord, David said, is also the stronghold of my life. It descri describes a strength or protection that cannot be penetrated. In my banking days, uh, when I worked in various branches, uh, each branch would have a safe in which the money was kept. But that safe itself was then kept inside a room that we called the strong room. It was specifically built that it could not be penetrated by normal tools. It had its own door and combination on the front. So before you could even get to the safe, you had to be able to go through multiple combinations of the strong room. David said, it's as though God is the strong room of my life to give a, penetra uh, to give a protection that cannot be easily penetrated by those around. This truth gave David great confidence. So these initial verses declare David's confidence in his God within varying circumstances that he faced. And he enunciates some of these. He says, when evil advances. In other words, when evil focuses its sights particularly on me. He says, when people attack me. 
when my life is subject to the wrong intent of others, even through slander and defamation, which brings pain to my life. He goes on to say, when my life is besieged. In other words, I'm cornered with nowhere to turn. All exits appear blocked. And it could be even today that you sense that in your life, that there just does not seem to be a way out, a way forward for where you are in. And then he says, though war break out. Of course, David knew war in its literal sense with the nations round about. But there's also a sense in this phrase that it refers to when my life just ends up in utter chaos, to the point where the daily routine has gone and survival is the name of the game. Describing all this, he then summarises that in the midst of these things, he says, my heart will not fear. I will be confident. It's his declaration of a value system that was deep into his heart. But he then opens up about his personal thoughts. Having focused upon God as the object of his confidence, it is almost that for a moment he forgets his circumstances and he meditates upon his God. His desire is, he says, to dwell in the house of the Lord forever, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, to see him in his temple. This is, this is not a reference to David wanting to set up home in the, the church tabernacle building, as it were, but an intense desire to be where the presence of God is real. The tabernacle and temple were the places of expression of God's presence among his people. David had this compelling desire to be where God was. It is a challenge to us to not simply accept the truth that God is with us always like a puppy that follows us around in our life. We too need this compelling inward conviction that we want to find out what God is about and become involved with him. So David is really saying, when the chips are really down, he will keep me safe in his dwelling, his presence, and he will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle, or it said his sacred tent, the inner place of his life. The original word actually means pavilion. The royal pavilion was actually a tent that was erected um, when an army was out to fight its enemy, right in the middle of where the army encamped. So on 360 degrees, this pavilion tent was secure by the, his, the army of the nation. And the king dwelt in that tent when he was out in battle. This is an amazing truth for us to take hold of. David says, if God has a place like that, a place where he dwells, where, where it is the stronghold, as it were, of life. David says, I would love to be there with God. David then uses this, this expression that his God will set him upon a rock. This is actually a military phrase referring to when a king conquered a foreign army. He would often climb up on a rock or the highest vantage point to be able to declare the victory. So not only did David believe his God would protect him, he believed God would stand him upon a rock of victory over those who tried to pull him down. The advance of evil, personal attacks, besieged on all sides and all out war, and still being able to be confident. What produces a man like this? And what produces a confidence like that in the heart of a person? Well, in the next verse from verses 7 to 12 in this same chapter, it gives us an insight as the mood of the psalm changes. The first six verses are a confident, dec confident declaration that almost has a sense of bravado about it. David knows his God declares his confidence no matter what seems to stand in front of him. But in the second part of the psalm, it's as though David is brought back to earth and he realises 
who he is. His God stands unchallenged, but he himself is fallible and even fragile, and he knows it. Although he has declared his convictions, he needs to tell God with absolute honesty exactly how he feels. For he does not feel courageous and invincible on his own. These are just some of the words he now shares. He says, hear me when I pray. It's almost as though he just wants to make sure that God is listening to him. He says, be merciful to me. He's acutely aware of his own failures. Do not reject or forsake me. David, deep down, may have even had a self-esteem problem or just wanted the inner confidence in God to match his, de his declaration. And then a great but simple prayer. David says, God, teach me your way. There are a lot of options out there, David was saying. But God, teach me how to live as you require. And then lead me in a straight path. The inference here is that David wants to pursue a path that is honest and straight, not devious and cunning. These verses, in a way, reveal a vulnerable man. This is not to say he was untalented. David was anything but. He was a skilled and courageous general in leading his army. He was a talented musician and a poet, quite extra -awed. He was a man of deep compassion who had learned as a shepherd to care for those in his keeping. The Bible says that he was a handsome man. And of course, above all, he was king. In all above areas, he no doubt knew how to act with great confidence. And yet, there's a sense in his inner life, he knew that there was somewhat fragile capacity in his own heart. And I picture this psalm, I see this aspect in these words. In the face of all manner of challenges and destructive circumstances, he knew the truth that God was the confidence and he openly declared it. But then he also knows his own heart. And I like to think of the second part of the psalm a bit like David coming to God, as it were, almost late at night and knocking on his door and just simply saying, God, can we have a talk? I don't know whether anybody's ever come up to you at some time and there may be other people around or it may be a side and they just tap you on the shoulder and just in a, in a quiet way they say, do you have a few minutes? Can we have a talk? You can sense from that that they really don't want to talk about the weather or the last week's football match or, or something um, that's not that important. There's something upon their heart and they'd like to share it. And I sense that in these moments, David is pressing in to God and saying, God, can we just have a few moments? You see, when we come like that, there is no mask that we can put up before God because he knows all that we are. He knows our weaknesses. He knows everything about us. We want him then to be the source of our confidence. So after all this, after making this great declaration in the face of all adversity, after considering his own heart and the inner potential to fail, David still comes out at the end and says these beautiful, encouraging, and I think powerful words. He says, I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And then he says, it's as though he then has a little conversation with his own heart and says, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. You see, it's not really a matter of how loud we shout the declaration or confidence that we have in God. It's whether it is a core value that is lived in our life every day. Often in the face of adversity, we can respond with a declaration of our trust in God and our faith in him. 
and it's, it's well-founded and it's true, but we need to know that it saturates deep in our life so that in the long term, it enables us to be able to have a confidence that sees through these circumstances and doesn't just speak at them. David is brutally honest. He declares this confidence in God unashamedly. Even when the enormity of the situations becomes real to him, he still presses into God. And through all of this, his confidence in God remains rock solid. Today, our world is shaken. Our world is looking for hope. The foundations of people's lives, indeed the foundations of nations, uh, in some cases seems to have been shattered. Confidence is not a, a word that a lot of people have toward the future. They may have wishful thinking. They may have a sense that they hope it turns out in this way. But to have an anchor in their soul that regardless of the circumstances, known and unknown, that they are able to know that I can face the future with a confidence which is assured. Today, as we look at this psalm and the words of David, I wonder as I finish whether we could make a declaration that would go something like this. Despite the uncertainties in our world, in my world, the upheaval of many of the values around about me, the chaos and dysfunctionality that I observe, despite the personal hardships that I and we together face, the disappointments that come before us or the heartaches that we endure, I am still confident of this. That in the midst of all of these, I will see the goodness of the Lord around me. You see, the goodness of God is not simply shown in a utopia type experience. The goodness of God is observed by those who have the, his faith as an anchor to the soul, who are able to have a confidence in him that is not just a declaration of the mouth, although we may need to do that, but it's an inner, excuse me, an inner security of our heart. And today I trust that as we see these words of King David, that we may be encouraged to press into him as our supreme confidence that we may know him, that we may let him know the fragileness of our lives. And even through all of that, we will be able to come out individually, together, and encourage one another and say, we will see the goodness of the Lord. For this we are confident. Let us pray together. Our Father, may it be that you will firmly implant into our lives this day a confidence in your person, in your character. We thank you for the words of King David. We thank you for the honesty of his life and the words that he has written. And Father, I pray for each one of us, including myself, that Father, as we Look forward through the corridors of the future. That, Father, we may know, we may know, we may know that our confidence is in you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless. Thank you, Keith, so much for that message. And some of you may be meeting together in your homes and we've got some questions that you might like to actually consider together. Uh, the first one, consider a time when you lost all confidence. How did that feel and how did you overcome it? Another one, what does it mean to you right now to have confidence in the Lord? Be honest and if necessary, express struggles you may have in this regard.
and one more for you. What one thing can you take away from Psalm 27? Thanks so much for joining us with us this week. It was great to have you with us and we look forward to seeing you again soon.